Church. Uh, those of you that are joining us online, we're so glad that you could join us. Uh, let's all stand and we are going to open our evening service in prayer. Let's bow our hearts and our heads. Our God, we're so grateful again and so thankful to be saved. We're so thankful to be able to be a part of your body, the Church of Jesus Christ. We're so thankful for the gathering of the saints. We're grateful, Father, that we have the privilege of being able to gather together and, and encourage one another and worship you most importantly. And as we prayed this morning, Father, we pray that you would be the audience, that you make us mindful that we are not here, uh, that we are here to worship you. May that be our focus, and may we, as we fellowship together and enjoy the communion, the fellowship of the saints, as we pray, as we do everything that we do in church services, uh, may we be mindful that you are in our presence. We ask your blessing tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Please remain standing. All right, let's turn to hymn 43, Rejoice the Lord is King, hymn 4, 3. Just a couple of announcements this evening. Uh, June 28th uh, marks our 30-year anniversary. So we're looking for pictures, uh, our church activities, our people from the past 30 years. Uh, please send them to Pastor. Uh, we are anticipating a special baptism service for next Sunday. Is that an evening? Next Sunday evening? I'm assuming, yeah. Okay. If you would like to be baptized that day, please speak with Pastor Lyon. And... Uh, we are looking for more people to take on the ministry of providing transportation to two ladies uh, to and from church on Sundays. Uh, the more help, uh, the less is put on one family. Uh, please let Pastor know if you, if you can provide that service. This time we'll bow in prayer as we uh, get ready to take the offering. Dear Lord, we just thank you for uh, your many blessings. Lord, we thank you for this body of believers, Lord, and we just thank you for the provision you've provided over the last 30 years. Uh, helps to be wise uh, with the spending of those funds, Lord. And we ask this in your precious name. Amen. Amen.
Amen. Thank you, Jason. Please take your Bibles and turn to 1 John chapter 3. 1 John chapter 3. And when you get there, let's all stand for the reading of God's Word. The reading tonight is in 1 John chapter 3. Beginning in verse 19, down through the end of the, end of the chapter. But tonight we are going to spend our time in the last verse, verse 24. That will be our text for today. But for the context, uh, we will begin reading in verse 19. Please follow along as I read. <clears throat> and hereby we know that we are of the truth, and shall assure our hearts before Him. If our heart condemn us, God is greater than our heart, and knoweth all things. Beloved, if our heart condemn us not, then we have confidence toward God. And whatsoever we ask, we receive of Him, because we keep His commandments and do those things that are pleasing in His sight. And this is His commandment, that we should believe on the name of His Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another, as He gave us commandment. And He that keepeth His commandments dwelleth in him, and he in him. And hereby we know that he abideth in us by the Spirit which he hath given us. May God bless his word. Let's bow together in prayer. Father, again, we're so grateful today that as we bow our hearts before you, that we are confident, we are certain, that we are communicating with the living, omnipotent, invisible God. And that you have made yourself known to us so clearly in the scriptures. You've made yourself known uh, through the person of Jesus Christ. And Lord, I pray that you would bless us tonight. And that every believer, every born again, blood washed believer would have that confidence that John talks about throughout this epistle. That we would, that it would be a part of our conversation just like, is it, a part, just like it is a part of your word that we would have that certainty, I know. And Father, if there's folks listening today, sitting under the Word here, and they don't have that confidence, Lord, I do pray that they would not have peace until they get that confidence, that they also can know for sure that they have the Spirit of God, that their names are written in the Book of Life, that they are saved. And we ask Your blessing tonight through Your Word, we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. And you may be seated. Let's turn to hymn 539, Singing I Go, hymn 539. The trusting heart to Jesus clings, not any ill forebodes. But at the cross of Calvary sings, Praise God for lifted loads. Singing I go along life's road, Praising the Lord, praising the Lord. Singing I go along life's road, For Jesus has lifted my load. The passing days bring many cares, Fear not, I hear him say, and when my fears are turned to prayers, the burden slips away. Singing I go along life's road, praising the Lord, praising the Lord. Singing I go along life's road, for Jesus has lifted my load. He tells me of my Father's love and never slumbering I. My everlasting King above will all my needs supply. Singing I go along life's road, praising the Lord, praising the Lord. Singing I go along life's road, Jesus has lifted my load. When to the throne of grace I flee, I find the promise true. 
the mighty arms upholding me will bear my burdens too. Singing I go along life's road, praising the Lord, praising the Lord. Singing I go along life's road, for Jesus has lifted my load. First John chapter 3, please turn there. Thank you for being here tonight, those of you that are here. I like preaching to people. And I know there's people out there, but I can't see them. And I don't even see the texts as they come in, if they comment. But uh, I am just so glad to be able to preach God's Word. And uh, we are going through the book of John, First John, excuse me. This is message 35, if I am keeping correct record. We're at First John chapter 3, verse, 34, or verse 24. And the title of the message tonight is based upon a saying that John repeats. In fact, just look at the text we read today uh, in our scripture reading, beginning in verse 19. And hereby, hereby we know that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before Him. Hereby we know. We have assurance in our hearts. And then in verse 24, our text today, He that keepeth his commandments dwelleth in him and he in him, and hereby we know that he abideth in us. So we see this idea that God is communicating, and this, this is not the only time in First John. This is a theme that he hits over and over again. He wants us to know. He wants us, and the title of the message tonight is, I am certain. And I hope that you, are certain. I hope that you have that assurance of all the things that John is talking about. Uh, again, that we know we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts. Remember I've mentioned before that the nature of deception is that you don't know what's happening to you. But I love the example of, of when Jesus made the blind see. And, that, and I love that song, Amazing Grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm... I once was blind, but now I see. And, and you imagine, I know, I think... Uh, how can you not think of someone who's blind and not think of our beloved Jane? Everything I know about blind people, I know Jane has taught me. And I've learned so much, and I'm still learning. Um, but if Jane was able to see, all of a sudden, if she was able to get sight... Wouldn't it be ridiculous for someone to come up to her, because Jane has lived her 29 years on this earth, <laughs> without being able to see. And, you know, if all of a sudden she got sight, it would, she, would, she would know the difference because of the contrast. And it, imagine how weird it would be if someone came up to Jane and started doubting, I don't really think you were blind. Or, how do you know you're not still blind? You know, she would know. And in fact, I'm looking for, I would... When Jane gets her new glorified body, she's going to be able to see. And uh, what she sees will be sights that are far superior to all the things that our eyes are seeing now. But I would love to be there when Jane gets her sight. But the nature of deception is you don't know it happens to you, but we know. And, and again, so many religions, that is just nothing but arrogant. How can you say that you know because, again, to so many people, their, their hope of heaven is a hope-so hope. And they do not have the assurance that God wants His people to have. And nowhere is it made cle clearer than in the epistle of 1 John. That we would know, again, hereby we know that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before Him. And now we come down to verse 24. He that keepeth his commandments. This is what his theme has been. Verse 22, whatsoever we ask, we receive of him because we keep his commandments. Quote a few more of the verses in the past that have talked about keeping his commandments. But um, he, he that keepeth his commandments dwelleth in him, and he in him, and hereby we know that he abideth in us by the Spirit which he hath given us. First John, if I could summarize it, 
up to this point. Um, assurance comes, and it's something that God gives His people through the revealed Word so that you and I, people that have assurance, people that get saved, have that assurance as they walk with the Lord. That's the idea of keeping His commandments. And we're going to talk more about this. The statement, the phrase that He uses here in our text. If you abide in Me. That's synonymous with keeping the commandments. And it simply means we are walking in the Spirit. When you and I are walking in obedience to God, He gives us assurance. And here's the thing. We are, we all, be, we are all on the same page. And that's, that is the idea of... Um, you know, that, that because we're on the same page with God, we delight in the things He delights in. We are praying for the things as we learn His will. And we are readjusting our walk in light of His communicated desires for us. His commandments are not grievous. This is the love of God. In fact, I believe this is later on in, in our epistle here. This is the love of God that we keep His commandments and His commandments are not grievous. Just like when you fall in love with someone, anyone that you love, you find out what they like, what they don't like, and you, you order your life. You want to you be a blessing to that person. If there's things that you do that they don't like. You, you know, that's the idea. And when you love God, who does have authority over us, but also we want to please Him, and He has communicated that. And as we walk in obedience, and, and again, no one keeps God's word perfectly. We all, all sin and come short of the glory of God. By the way, that did not stop the day you got saved. There's some people that teach, um, what is that called, the eradication of the sin nature? Boy, talk about self that you gave a laugh that I could totally relate to. You know, that that idea is, you know, we, we know that that's not true, don't we? By our experience. So, are these people like living in a different, on a different playing field, a higher level? Or are they just not being honest with themselves? That's what it is, right? So let me give you the outline. We're going to jump right in. But anyway, so here's the thing. I want, it is important for you and I, uh, if we're going to have fellowship, and here's, the, here's the, the bottom line. John is talking to people that are born again, that are saved. Saved people that are walking with the Lord don't agree on everything, but they're on the same page in that they want to please the Lord. And that's what gives them common commonality it's what gives them fellowship we are all on the same page we speak the same language i read the story of a grandfather that uh, went into a kfc and i can totally relate to this because apparently his grandchildren wanted chicken you know they were going to get their chicken meals and they wanted legs specifically and there was a time where one of my sons was real big on kfc and he just he loved the legs and whenever we get a bucket of chicken, it'd be like, okay, can we have like extra legs, you know? So the dad, the dad, the grandfather orders, and he says, uh, he goes up, he's placing the order, and he says, um, he says, kids meal with a leg, and the order taker says, which side? And the, the grandfather's silent. The left side, I guess. <laughs> and after. After the taker, the order taker started laughing. She goes, no, I mean, what do you want as your side? Potato wedges or mashed potatoes? And, you know, I love that. Those two people were not on the same page, you know, different. He just, he got thinking the wrong way. But when you're on the same page as believers, we are on the same page. And there's going to be people, folks, that have not, the difference they can't relate to this because they've not been born again. And if someone's not born again, no matter what they say, they're not going to be on the same page with us. So, it, it, the important thing is not that you agree with us, it's that we agree with God. That's the important thing. So here's the outline, and we're just going to jump right in. We're going to see three things. The title of, it, of the message is, I Am Certain. And we are going to see God's perspective his providence, and His provision. All in this verse, verse 24. First, His perspective. That's the idea of keeping His commandments. And we'll, we'll look at that. Secondly, His providence. That is the idea of Him dwelling in us, us dwelling in Him. Uh, this is the wonderful 
challenge. We'll go back to, to John 15, where I believe John is talking about those teachings of Jesus from that text, where Jesus said, abide in me. And there's a whole lot there, we'll look at that. But that is His providence. And then thirdly, His provision, which is the Spirit He has given us is His provision. So let's jump in. Again, go back to verse 22 as we see His perspective. Verse 22 says, Whatsoever we ask, we receive of Him because we keep His commandments and do those things that are pleasing in His sight. Now verse 24. And He that keepeth His commandments dwelleth in Him, and He in Him. In other words, God dwells in us, we are dwelling in Him, and hereby we know that He abideth in us. So remember, folks, this verse, is tw- verse 24, is hitting it hard. He wants to give us assurance. Here's how we know that He abides in us, we abide in Him by the Spirit He gives us. So again, verse 24, He that keepeth His commandments dwelleth in Him, He in Him, and hereby we know that He abideth in us. So, let's go back to this idea of keeping His commandments. And we've already hit this because it's been a theme and He's going to mention it again. But the idea of keeping His commandments, again I remind you, the law, which is His commandments generally, is a schoolmaster to bring us to faith. Right? And I I love Romans 3.19. It's a verse I've been quoting and preaching and sharing Almost since I, I became acquainted with the Gospel, something that I learned early on, that verse, as a religious young man, hearing the Gospel, it says, We know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law. It's, it's, it's one of the clearest verses that tells us the purpose of the commandments. And, and you want to just boil it down, the Ten Commandments. What is that? That every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. That was a revelation to me. Because for 17 years, I was trying as earnestly as I could, as a wicked sinner, as earnestly as I wanted to, I was trying to keep the commandments. And I thought like so many people, well, you know, I, I, I haven't broken that many commandments. You know, I, if, if my good outweighs my bad, I, you know, I, haven't, you know I, thought, I thought I had a chance. But the purpose of the law was not to try and save me so I could keep His commandments. It was to condemn me and show me I needed a Savior. That every mouth may be stopped. What's that mean? Justifying ourselves. Remember Ephesians 2, 8 and 9? For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, we don't get saved by stuff we do, not of yourselves, uh, not of works, lest any man should boast. Nobody's going to get to heaven and say, Lord, you should let me in because, man, I've sure been good. You know those Ten Commandments? I kept three of them. No, you know, I mean, we just boast. There's no boasting because the law condemns us. That's why it is a schoolmaster to bring us to faith. The law can't save anyone. It only condemns. So then what is John talking about? Keeping his commandments. Well, the Bible makes it very clear that when when you and I realize we can't keep His commandments and that only Jesus Christ fulfilled the law and, and He kept, in fact, He says this. We'll look at this tonight, at least it's in my text. That doesn't mean we'll get there. But He said, I keep my Father's commandments. And, and that's the idea. So now you and I, we don't, we don't keep them perfectly but the righteousness of the law is fulfilled in us who walk in the Spirit. Now we still, still sin and fall short of the glory of God. So the idea of keeping the commandments, every time John brings this up, and I've met so many dear, precious Christians that if they, if they don't have strong assurance of their salvation, and they've definitely, you know, people I know have been born again, they have tender hearts, they struggle with going through 1 John. Because every time they see this, keep His commandments, keep His commandments, it, it just turns back on them. And they're, all they're doing is thinking of their own unworthiness and the latest commandment they broke. 
And, and by the way, you're saying, wow, there's people that break the command. Don't forget the standard of Jesus. Now, we're not talking about killing someone. You have hatred in your heart. You broke it. We're not talking about committing adultery. You got lust in your heart. You, you know the whole thing there, right? So the, the standard. And, and so they will constantly go through this and see, keeping His commandments, and they cannot interpret it any other way in their mind than, I have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And now John is saying, oh, we who keep His commandments. Is John saying, come on, there's a whole group of people that are perfect? No. The idea of keeping, let's look at this word keeping. Because this is a key thing in understanding the context of, of this statement. The idea of keeping something has the idea of keeping something before you. Let me read a couple of scriptures. Proverbs 13, verse 3. He that keepeth his mouth, keepeth his life. The idea of there is guarding it. Uh, he that openeth wide his lips shall have destruction. When we, uh, you know, the Bible, it, I forgot to write this down. You ever pray, Lord, keep, set a watch, O Lord, before my mouth? That's the idea of this proverb. We're keeping, keeping it before us. That's, I did write it down. Psalm 141, <laughs> verse 3. Proverbs 10, 17 says, he, he is in the way of life that keepeth instruction. The idea of keeping God's commandments has the idea, because we're not, we're not perfectly fulfilling them, but we're keeping them before us. In the same way, I keep my wife's desires, you know, what she likes and what she does, and I keep them before me uh, because I love her. And, and you know, she sh expressed certain... You know, we, we tend to both become, we, we become very, um, what's that, OCD, you know. And uh, there's things that I will do that I'm really freaky about. And uh, there's things that she will do. And she tells me, okay, this, this is the way I like it. Now, at first I bucked, but when you've been married for going to 36 years, you learn to adapt. And now, I want to please my wife. And, and I actually... Some of the things I used to balk at, I'm like, no, nah, that makes sense. You know, I'm, I'm all on board. And now they're my desire too. So I keep these things before me. And that's the idea. When we walk with God, we are keeping His commandments before us. Not that, again, not that we are perfect, but we love God. And so, by the way, when you keep something before you and you, you, you break it, you know, right? But how do you know? And why do you feel guilty? Why do you repent? Because you're keeping it before you. That's the idea. Look at, listen to John 15. Let's go back to John 15. Because I, I believe that John is thinking of this, uh, it, this teaching of Jesus. John 15 and verse 7. Jesus said, in fact, it starts out in verse, in verse 1, I am the vine, you're the branches. And it all builds on that. Verse 7, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will, and it shall be done unto you. Herein is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit. So shall ye be my disciples. Now look, here's what he says. As the Father loved me, so I have loved you. Continue ye in my love. That's the idea of keeping his commandments. It's we're just continuing in his love. If ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love. It's just, it's just we want to walk with God. There's people that used to walk with God. In every church, there's Bible-believing church, there's multitudes of people throughout their history that have had people walk with them for a time. Some of them go on to other churches and they're still keeping God's Word before them. Some of them just forsake God's Word. And by the way, those people uh, are, can always return to the fold, can't they? Just get right back with the Lord. Maybe they didn't get saved in the first place. They've got to get saved. And then they can keep God's before, words before them. That's, that's what God wants for us. Verse 10, If you keep my commandments, you shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in His love. These things have I spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you, that your joy might be fulfilled. This is my commandment, that ye love one another, as I have loved you. Wow, we've heard that one a lot, haven't we? So, his perspective. 
being on the same page with God. And I want to I want to remind you as we think about your relationship. First of all, as we talk about this, do you know that you're saved the Bible way that you that this is talking about you that you're abiding in him? He's abiding in you and and this applies to you so that you are certain that you have that knowledge. I know that I have it because God has saved me. Uh, I had religion up to the age of 17. When I got saved, when I got born again, I got it. And I understand. And the fruit is in my life. And, and I, don't, I know the experience because the Spirit of God dwells in me. And I also know that it is not something that can be manufactured. And there's people... I, I'm certain there's people that have come up through our ranks, came to our church, no longer part of church at all, and, and they maybe they saw what we had, but they didn't have it themselves. Because I want to tell you what I got, you don't want to walk away from. You don't want to walk away from that. Here's a saying I heard, or I've said to you many times. Remember this? Let's keep this in mind. This is what I want for our church. I want the Lord to work, but, what? I want the Lord to work, right? I want the Lord to work, but I want it to be the Lord that is working. I got that from an email and sermon audio. Interesting thing, because, uh, once again, I forget the guy's name. Steve Lee, not Stan Lee, that's the Marvel guy, isn't it? Steve Lee, I think it was. He, he writes the emails, he's the guy that started up sermon audio 21 years ago. And I, I shared this quote, but listen to what he said, because this, this is bleak, but this describes America. He said, we've been running sermon audio for 21 years. We've seen over 380 million sermons downloaded worldwide. Wow, that is awesome. 380 million sermons have been downloaded. This was about a couple months ago. Uh, worldwide. And yet, it seems the church's influence is weak as ever on the world around us. Well, thank you, Mr. Lee, for getting me so discouraged. Because that's exactly what's happening. And he goes on. He says, cultural sins are out of control. No! Really? They have and passed over into insanity. That's what I have been seeing. Our society is fiercely trying to erase its own godly history. I see it. And here's the kicker of it all. The church has completely lost her voice. <laughs> okay, now you know why I'm so depressed. You know, that's it. That's our problem. Pretty bleak. So you know what that shows us though? The Lord's not working. I mean, if the Lord was really working in a big way, the church would have an influence, folks. And so... What would the world look like? What would it look like if the Lord was working? I want to read to you from a college president, I think it was, from dev decades ago in America, where at least on a college campus for a time, there seemed to be a revival. And I love reading stories about revival. I love Leonard Ra Ravenhill's Why Revival Tarries. You know, I love... there. Clearly, there are times in history when God's, God's Spirit does a work. And so on this college campus, I believe it was in New Jersey, the president is, is commenting on what happened. And, and God was doing something through His Word on this campus. I think it was a Christian liberal arts campus, college. And here, here's what he said. And I love this. Because this is God working. You don't manufacture this stuff. Here's what he said. Again, this was a college campus where it was just nominally Christian. And something happened. People got saved. People got on fire and their lives radically changed. And it wasn't just one or two. It was like majorly impacted the whole campus. I don't know for how long. But the president said this. Things that were simply tradition became reality. Things that were simply vocabulary became human experience. And what had been transmitted from head to head 
suddenly, now suddenly became living reality in people's hearts. Now it was interesting to me to see what the emphasis was with the Holy Spirit in those days. The emphasis was never upon the gifts of the Spirit. The emphasis was upon sin, the need for repentance, the need for restitution, the need for repairing relationships, hmm, keeping my commandments. Human being to human being, the need for bringing a life into obedience. Wow. Keeping my commandments. That's revival. That's when God is working. When all of a sudden, God's opinion matters to more than one person. By the way, I love what he said there. I love that. He said it was interesting he learned. As his observation was, it was interesting to see how the Holy Spirit worked. And by the way, anyone that claims the Holy Spirit's working, you've got to sift it through the, the Scriptures. Because a lot of people are claiming this is a work of the Spirit of God. The laughing revival, did you hear about that? In Toronto, I know this was a couple decades ago. There was nothing scriptural about it. That was not my Holy Spirit that's dwelling in my heart. But he said the emphasis was never upon the gifts of the Spirit. There's a lot of denominations that will exalt the Holy Spirit. But I love what Jesus said in John chapter 16, because he, he shared with us the ministry of the Holy Spirit is going to be to glorify, is not to glorify himself. Spirit of God will never magnify himself. He did not, it was never upon the gifts. His job was to glorify Jesus Christ and to convict of sin. That's what real work of God would look like. So when I say I want the Lord to work, but I want the Lord to work, would you pray with me for that? I, I, you know, some churches are very good at manufacturing revival. And it's so easy to get caught up. I remember um, a dear lady that went to a different kind of church. She was telling us about the church experience. And she'd come home on Sunday, Sunday, not mornings. They had hour services. And they, they got worked up into a frenzy. And I mean, they, it was, I mean, it made us look like, the, you know, the uh, Mormon Tabernacle. No, what's the, the, um, the old Gregorian chants, you know, just, you know, like boring. But the problem is, it was all emotion. And she was not getting fed the Word of God from what I could see any meat that was helping her get through the Christian life, and there would be a major crash on, on Monday. This, this is the Lord really working. That's what we need. So that, that again is uh, our first point. His perspective, keeping His commandments. Then we see His providence. It's us well, in fact, again, look at the text here. John chapter, or 1 John chapter 3, verse 24. He that keepeth his commandments dwelleth in him, and he in him. And hereby we know that he abideth in us. This all goes back to John chapter 15. I'm the vine, you're the branches. If you abide in me, you're going to bring forth fruit. If you don't abide in me, you're not going to bring forth fruit. And, and this, is, this is fulfilling and going on with that. We dwell in Him. And we know that we are abiding. That He abides in us. Do you know? Are you certain that God is abiding in you? I am. And it has nothing to do with my performance. Well, it does. Because when I perform good, I'm encouraged. When I perform bad, I'm convicted. You know, But I am certain that the Holy Spirit is dwelling within me. And that these things, because God's Word is ever before me. So, our challenge then, as we, we move to the next point, we see His providence dwelling in Him. This is a blessing that God is telling us that the Christian should experience an ongoing relationship with Him. God abides in us. We are in Him. He is, we talked about this two Wednesday. I don't think it was last Wednesday. I want to talk about this again. And I want to use an example that I shared not a, a week ago on Wednesday during our prayer meeting. I want to share an example. Because it, it goes from something that I heard Vody Bauckham say, but it goes back to the providence of God. First of all, what is the providence of God? Uh, well, first of all, providence is a place in Rhode Island that was actually named providence by a Baptist. 
Did you know that? Uh, Roger Williams was kicked out of the Massachusetts Bay Colony in the early 1600s. And as he was wandering, looking for a place to stay, uh, he came across and he, and he was looking especially for a place with a supply of water. And the circumstances led to a place where he was convinced it was divine providence, the hand of God, that provided water, a well, and, and he called that place Providence. And in fact, to this day, um, Rhode Island officially is called Rhode Island and Providence Plantations. Something like that. So what is Providence? Providence, folks, is it is described as God's care in our lives. He's working in our lives. And I want to, um, I want to share something that I found out about a week ago last Tuesday at a meeting. Uh, uh, one of the men that's on our committee, on our council, shared he had just had another meeting with a group of Christian school leaders in a, in a group. And I, I forget what day they met on. But uh, they regularly meet, and they're kind of connected in, with a lot of churches that are in our fellowship. And they had a, they had a, a meeting scheduled for this, this group of leaders, Christian school educators, principals, pastors. Uh, and, and they planned to have a meeting, and then they had to postpone the meeting. And Pastor Harris is the one that shared this. He said, now that happens all the time. It happens with our meetings. Whenever you, whenever you postpone a meeting like that, most often you have to plan it at least a few more weeks ahead of time. That's usually what happens. For some strange reason, they were able to move the meeting to the next day. Uh, maybe the place where they were meeting, it, it became available and it worked with everyone's schedule. It, it, uh, Pastor Harris said that has never happened before. Where we were able to skip the meeting and then do it the next day. So they met together. And, and, and men come from all over Pennsylvania. These are all educators of Christian schools all over Pennsylvania. They all drive. I think it might have been in Harrisburg. I forget where it was. But here's the key. It was very close to a quality medical center that was at least an hour away from one of the men's houses that was on this board. One educator, a principal of a Christian school, would drive an hour to this meeting. Big deal. You ever drive an hour? Might have, it might have driven two hours. They had the meeting, and as they're having the meeting, this man all of a sudden just fell back in his chair. And as, obviously, you know, you know how your eye goes to motion? Everyone's looking at him. And as he's falling back, I think he went like this or something, like, I'm okay, you know, because everybody's worried about him. As he fell on the ground, everybody got, got, got him up, got, you know, wanted to make sure he was okay. He was assuring them he was okay. And over the next few minutes, it became very evident that he was not okay. I mean, it was the color in his skin. They called 911. And they were able to rush him, because of where they were at, they were able to rush him to a very nearby, um, I forget the name of the medical center, very high, you know, very a good medical center, and that's the place he would have been have to be airlifted to this place. It ends up he goes there. Uh, his his health deteriorated rapidly. He ended up having a ten hour surgery. He was having an, what's called an aortic dissection. You ever hear of that? Ten hour surgery that saved his life. Now, uh, here's the thing. Again, if he had been at home that day. He would have died. No doubt about it. Now here's Vody Bauckham pointed this out. He said we tend to talk about all the wonderful things that happen when we see God intervene. And we say that's the providence of God. And we tend to only think of and communicate the providence of God when things happen good. But folks, the providence of God is going on. It's God's watch care in our lives in everything. And so I've thought about this scenario because as we heard about that, like that, the next few days, we, we had another meeting and Pastor Harris shared this story and we were all 
I mean, that, that, uh, that encourages me. Does that encourage you, hearing stories like that? That is God's providence, isn't it? But let's remember, first of all, that's, that's where you see the good hand of God. You see it. And it assures us. When I hear stories like that, folks, I am strengthened in the faith and I'm encouraged. But I want you to remember that the providence of God is, that's, God is doing that all the time. Even when, let's say that this principle died. Horrible. Let's say he didn't, let's say those circumstances didn't take place and they had to push the meeting back for three weeks and he died on that day because he couldn't get to the hospital. He died en route to the hospital because he had an aortic dissection. Was the providence of God still involved? And here's where we have to remember this. You see, God is orchestrating things, folks. If every single story was like that, you and I wouldn't have to walk by faith anymore. We wouldn't. We'd just, hey, you want to hear what happened today? We'd be like, in fact, we'd probably be so, yeah, what happened? Oh, yeah, of course. God miraculously worked. Doesn't He always, you know? Well, yes, He does always. But it's not always the way we, in, in that scenario, I mean, we love hearing those stories. That's the way we want. If that's going to happen to us, I want it to happen that way. But it doesn't always happen that way. But God is still good and He's still providentially overseeing things in our lives. Let's not forget that. Finally, verse 24, the last point that was His providence, second, or last is His provision. He that keepeth His commandments dwelleth in Him, and He in Him, and hereby we know that He abideth in us by His Spirit which He has given us. Jesus said this in John chapter 7. He said, the Bible says in verse 37, he said, In the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the Scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. And then John adds this comment, But this he spake of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. When Jesus was with His disciples, they didn't need the Holy Spirit there because they had Jesus there. The Comforter. But Jesus said, when I go, I'm going to give you another Comforter. The Holy Spirit. And He is going to be with you. He will abide in you. So folks, in a very real way, you and I have God with us, dwelling in us. What an amazing thing that is. Jesus said in John 14, If you love me, keep my commandments. And I will pray the Father, and He shall give you another comforter, that He may abide with you forever. Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive. Don't forget that. What you have as a born-again believer the world doesn't have. And they may, they may walk with us for a time, but if they don't have the Spirit of God, they're not going to get the same experience. Don't forget that. Because when people fall away, and people all of a sudden lose interest in Christianity, it could be because they don't have the Spirit of God. It could just be because they're walking away from the Lord, by the way, the Lord's going to make their life miserable. If you read Hebrews chapter 12, whom the Lord loves, He chastens. You know, And uh, there have been people that have been away for years that come back. It's like, okay, that, He was one of ours. You know. I want to close with this. Spirit of God. And uh, this comes from a, a homeschool digest that we get. And um, president of uh, a group called ADF, Americans Defending Freedom. Name's na the man's name is Michael Ferris. And uh, he wrote recently about prayer. He said, we know that prayer works. He said, and we, and he, he was saying this in light of all the turmoil that's going on in our country. He said, it's easy to lose heart. He said, I've, I've seen God work at times through law and politics. And he said, here's my favorite story. I love this. In the early 1980s, I was the leader of a pro-family lobby and legal group in Washington State. During that time, 
the state decided to introduce a lottery, ostensibly to raise money for schools. Believing it to be an unjust tax on the poor, I like Dave Ramsey, he says, you know what, um, the lottery is a tax on people that are bad at math, something like that, I like that. So Michael Ferris says, I led the opposition to the lottery. One day a friend called to tell me that a radio talk show host was bashing me on the air. I tuned in just in time to hear the host, who called himself Mad Dog, say that I was only interested in raising money for my organization. Isn't that interesting? So they said about Paul, he's only in it for the money. That made me angry. And I punched the show's number into my phone. It's a good thing that's the only thing he punched. He said, I tore into Mad Dog, making strong points about the lottery's harms. You're pretty good over the phone, he said. Are you man enough to come into the studio and do this face-to-face? Kind of reminds me of Paul again. All his letters are power and weighty, you know, but when he comes, he's, his presence is weak and contemptible. And so he, he got an invitation. He says, you bet. The station set a live on-air debate for the following week. On the morning of the show, I gathered my staff for prayer. We prayed a hedge of thorns around Mad Dog. That's uh, based on Hosea chapter 2. There's some things in there. He says, one of my associates prayed, God, as a special sign of your power, give Mike a chance to share the gospel over the air. Mad Dog was surprisingly genial as the show began. So, Mike, tell us why you oppose the lottery, my host invited. And I told him my reasons. He didn't react other than to say, interesting, let's take some calls. The phones lit up. One caller. I'm so sick and tired of hearing about you born-again Christians in politics, one of the first callers said. I don't want to ask anything about politics, I want to know, what does it mean to be born again? (laughs) So I told her the entire gospel story. Another listener called to spout his irritation. Mad dog, what's come over you? He yelled into the phone. You've let this guy turn this show into a a religious harangue. Mad dog, leave him alone. He was asked a question and he had the right to answer. The show continued most, uh, mostly uneventful from that point on. At the end, Mad Dog said, I don't know what happened today, but I agree with this guy. Not everything, mind you, but a lot. If you agree with him, send him some money. And then Mike's comment is, God tamed Mad Dog. God answers prayers in every venue of life. And, uh, and, and that's the blessing, folks. There is power in prayer. Now again, that's not going to happen every day. We're looking for that every day. And if we don't see it, 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 you know, if a few days go by and we're praying and we're looking for these things, then we've stopped walking by faith. God does answer prayer. He is working in a mighty way. And so we just need to pray that He will work in a mighty way. Let's pray. Father, thank You for Your Word. Bless us. Help us as we seek to honor You. Lord, we want to see revival. We want to see your mighty hand at work in our church and in America. And Lord, I pray that that we would see that, that you would demonstrate your power from on high, that it would be clear this is not man-made. This is truly a God thing, that we would bring glory and honor to you. And we ask your blessing in Jesus' precious name. Amen. I want to challenge you before we close as Dave comes up. Our big thing here at Bible Baptist Church is, is Jesus' big thing, is you need to be born again. Anyone listening online, if you are not born again, the most important thing in your life, if you want to experience what we're talking about, if you want to connect with the God that created you, you must be born again the Bible way. We would love to have someone uh, talk to you on the phone, If you, you know, email the church. We, if you want to hear what the gospel is and you want to know how can I be born again, that's what we're all about. Uh, you communicate with us and we will make sure uh, that, that you know what it means to be born again. You don't, do, you don't have to join the church. You don't have to give a donation. But you do. You need to be born again. Alright, let's, let's stand and we will close in song. Alright, let's turn to hymn 680. Rejoice in the Lord. Hymn 680. never moves with
without purpose or plan. When trying his servant and holding a man, give thanks to the Lord, for trusting seems long. In darkness he gave it a song. Oh, rejoice in the Lord, he makes no mistake, he knoweth the end of each path that I take. For when I am tried and purified, I shall come forth as gold. I could not see through the shadows ahead, so I looked at the cross of my Savior. Instead, I bowed to the will of the Master that day. Then peace came, and tears fled away. Oh, rejoice in the Lord, He makes no mistake. He knoweth the end of each path that I take. For when I am tried and purified, I shall come forth as gold. Now I can see testing comes from above. God strengthens his children and purges in love. My Father knows best, and I trust in His care. Through purging, for fruit I will bear. Oh, rejoice in the Lord, He makes no mistake. He knoweth the end of each path that I take. For when I am tried and purified, I shall come forth as gold. Amen. You're dismissed.